laser sights increase confidence regardless of experience level. Whether you're learning the fundamentals or overcoming aging eyes, Crimson Trace, making laser sight standard equipment. Visit crimsontrace.com to find a dealer near you. He rode out of Louisiana territory, and with his gun slung low and his microphone held high, he brought truth to a savage land. And the legend grew, Tom Gresham's Gun Talk. All right, saddle up. It is time for us to do a little bit more gun talk. Tom Gresham here. Our number is 866-TALK-GUN, or just dial Tom Talk Gun. That'll get you in here. All right, question on the floor for you. Um, things have changed over the years as we shoot our guns and we have new equipment and different calibers, although you can make the argument that the calibers of 50 or 100 years ago are just perfectly fine for almost everything we do. But be that as it may, one of the things that's changed is long-range shooting. We have competition for long-range shooting. We have rifles that are much more accurate than they've ever been. We have ammunition that's much better than it's ever been. We have incredible bullets, you know, incredibly accurate bullets, high ballistic coefficients, very good at uh, shooting flat, at not being affected as much by the wind. One area that probably doesn't get as much attention as it should is optics, how much better our optics are now than they used to be. And you put all of that together. By the way, if you're, (laughs) just a heads up, keep this in mind, if you're out shooting and your rifle isn't shooting really well and it's just all over the place, sometimes it's not your rifle. Assuming you know how to shoot, which is always a question and it's, you know, one of those delicate ones. Do you, when people say, well, my rifle just doesn't shoot. I said, well, do you have any rifles that shoot? Because if they don't, then maybe it's not the rifles. You know what I mean? Uh, but here's, you know, a thought. If your rifle's all over the place, maybe it's not your rifle. Don't forget that it could be the optic. Optics go weird. Scopes go weird on you sometimes. But, but optics are so much better now than they used to be. So here's a question for you. And I'm seriously looking for answers because I don't really know what the correct answer is. In the old days, which had been 10 years ago and beyond, the deal was we would, the traditional advice was, on your hunting rifle, pick a good flat shooting cartridge, 30-06, 7mm Magnum, 270, whatever it happens to be, 300 Magnum, whatever, and slide it in so that it hits 3 inches high at 100 yards. Well, why would you do that? Why wouldn't you decide it in so it hits exactly the right place? Well, here's the thinking. The scope is mounted above the barrel so that the bullet ha- actually has to be, or the rifle has to be aimed slightly upward for the bullet path to coincide with the line of sight from the scope. And you could have them intersect at 100 yards, and then the bullet's going to keep going up over the line of sight, and then it's going to come back down. You've seen the lines for the tra- trajectories. Just like throwing a baseball or a rock or anything else. You throw it up and it comes back down and hits the target. It's got to go up and then back down. By sliding in to hit three inches high at 100 yards, the idea is, well, I can shoot out to X without having to hold over. Because if you sight in exactly at 100 yards, then maybe at 200 yards, you may be an inch, inch and a half high. And at 300 yards, maybe you're 12 inches low. Just pick a number, it's out of the air. But they're probably not too far off. If you sight it in three inches high at 100 yards, and then you shoot at 200 yards, you're probably going to be four, four and a half inches high. And at 300 yards, you're probably going to be six inches low. On a deer, and there's, this is what this is about, on a deer or an elk, if you're four inches high down to about six inches low, you can just hold on and not worry about the bullet hitting high or low. So what it does is it gives you a 300, maybe even a 325-yard hold on, point blank, if you will, distance. But now we have these great rifles and these great scopes, and they're repeatable, and we have laser rangefinders. So the question for you is this. Do you 
do the old sighting in three inches high at 100 yards, or do you sight in exactly and have a scope that you can dial up and down? You can do the come-ups on, where you can use a laser rangefinder and you say, okay, that is 375 yards, and I will just simply go click, 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 boom, 375, hold on, good to go. For a hunter, is that too much to do? Do you do that, or are you using the old system? I'm just curious of how many people, how many hunters are incorporating the newer technology and using it. Do you take a rangefinder out with you when you go hunting? Now, obviously, if you're hunting in the deep woods, probably not a big deal. But if you're hunting at a place, and the thing is, it doesn't have to be out west. It can be a bean field in Alabama, and you could be looking at a 400 to 500-yard shot very easily. Uh, shooting a, a power line right away. There are a lot of places where you can get some long shots anywhere in the country. So let me know what you're doing. Are you using old school? Are you carrying a rangefinder? Are you using a scope as the come-ups on it? I'm just curious of what people are doing these days. Our number is 866-TALK-GUN or just dial me at Tom Talk Gun. We'll be right back with your calls. After a million rounds of testing, adapting to every mini red dot optic in the firearms industry, the new FN 509 Tactical became the perfect evolution of the world's most battle-proven firearms. Designed for mill-free compatibility, the FN 509 Tactical bears the most advanced patent-pending optics mounting system ever seen on the front lines or the home front. Set your sights on the new FN 509 Tactical. Tired of searching the web for the best deals on guns, ammunition, and gear? Download the free Gun Dealio app today for deals and discounts right at your fingertips. Handguns, rifles, shotguns, ammo, optics, lasers, gun safes, targets, gun cleaners, grips, slings, and much, much more. Save money on products you want from the companies you love. New deals, discounts, and rebates added daily. Gun Dealio, available for free in the App Store and Google Play. It's America's favorite 22 rifle. No matter how, where, or what you like to shoot, there's a Ruger 1022 for you. From the carbine to the incredible takedown models, the tactical and target versions, all Ruger 1022 models have a legendary action and detachable 10 round rotary magazine. Whether you're hunting squirrels or tin cans, there's a lifetime of fun in every Ruger 1022 rifle. See them all at Ruger.com. That's Ruger.com. For more than 70 years, Timney Triggers has been enhancing the shooter's experience. Whether it's a local competition, a day at the range, or even the hunt of a lifetime, setting the standard in aftermarket triggers, Timney is now producing more than 170 models of triggers for bolt-action rifles, shotguns, AR rifles, and semi-automatic rifles. Proudly made in the USA since 1946. Find your new trigger at TimneyTriggers.com. All right, back with you, 866 Talk Gun. Line four, John's with us out of Fargo, North Dakota. John, what has you pulling out your hair, man? Good afternoon, General Gresham. And I'm going to call you that from now on because I, I still feel you lead the troops pretty well. <laughs> I think I lead from behind, but go ahead. <laughs> well, I'm sitting there working some M1 carbine brass today and listening to the program, you know, and, 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 and you're talking about the election being 50 days away. And I think the thing that's annoying me the most, Tom, North Dakota is a pretty much pro-gun state, you know, basically 50% of us up here own guns, and the other 50% are married some way or another to those of us who own guns, you know, we're big on hunting mm-hmm. and everything else up here. Sure. And we, we have Heidi Heitkamp, who's a Democrat who only shows her true colors when it comes to voting on gun measures, you know. She's all, you know, one of those, I'm all about the Second Amendment, but when it comes down right. to voting. And then we have that. John Hoven, who's a Republican who does nothing, you know, and, 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 and I say does nothing because let's go back to H.R. 38, you know, when it worked its way through the House last year. And it was pretty much a partisan vote. All the Republicans voted for it. Pretty much all the Democrats voted against it. 
it got to the mm-hmm. Senate, and nobody wanted to touch that football. And as soon as the Parkland incident occurred, now everybody has to bear in mind here that, you know, both of these bills basically mimicked each other in the fact that what it was going to do was give us gun owners some national reciprocity finally. It was going to potentially mm-hmm. get rid of the suppressor, you know, tax stamp issue, and it was going to fix NICs. Well, after Parkland, all they wanted to do was remove everything except fix NICs. Then they voted on it, and, and we got nothing. Nobody on the Republican side wanted to pick the ball up and, 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 and just say, no, this is the ball, and this is the ball we're going to vote on. Take it or leave no, no, it. I, I, look, I, I get where you come from, and I understand the frustration. There, there are very few courageous people in Congress. I mean, I think we could just agree on that. And I am as disappointed as anybody in the Republicans year after year. Whenever they're in, they don't know how to lead. Whenever they're out, they do, you know we're we're dealing with the Democrats who are there. And I used to not talk about Republicans and Democrats that much. And I have come to realize that it's really. It's, a, it's about who's in leadership, who determines the committees, who uh, determines what's going to be voted on. And that's why it's critical. And, yes, I share your disappointment in trying to find a backbone anywhere in the Republican Party. And having said that, it, as bad as that is, John, we're 50 days away. And the, the, really the only question is, who do you want selecting the committee chairman? I mean – it comes down to well, that, I mean, and you've you got to hold your nose and do it. I mean, yeah, I understand yep. that aspect of it, Tom. But, you know, it, but like I said, I think that's where my biggest frustration is, is the fact that, you know, the Republicans are in charge. They've been in charge for two years, and we haven't gotten jack out of it. Well, I understand what you're saying. I just, well, what we've gotten is, I, I would have to disagree. We have gotten Neil Gorsuch on the Supreme Court, and we're about to get Brett Kavanaugh on the Supreme Court. And what we don't have is Hillary Clinton in the White House. So those three things are good enough for me. Right now, those are huge. Otherwise, we would have Operation Choke Point, and we would have Fast and Furious, and we'd have more and more stuff like that, and we would have open calls for gun bans, and we would be using surreptitiously the U.S. government agencies to try to destroy the gun industry. So, uh, yeah, we may not have gotten anything through Congress, but don't, you know, never, ever forget that most of the action actually comes about through the agencies and through the bureaucracies, and we're getting a lot done there. Look, i got to run because i got my guests lined up here right now. I appreciate your call, sir. I really do. Uh, In one of the, uh, I would guess perhaps, it would be surprising who the uh, author of this new book is. Uh, We're joined right now by uh, Ryan Kleckner. He's uh, listed as author, former ranger, sniper, attorney, professor. He does a lot of different things. Two tours in Afghanistan. Uh, Not only a sniper, but a sniper instructor of military and law enforcement. And then he gets out and goes to law school. And then he starts writing books. Hey, Ryan, how are you, man? Hey, Tom. I'm so glad to be on your show. I am sorry about the scheduling confusion. Ah, that's all right. No worries. Look, it's just pretty cool. My I mean, fault. You've been a long range, all long right. range instructor. You've been a, a shooter. Uh, you've been, uh, you know, an army ranger. You're uh, a mountaineer. You're an EMT, <laughs> and then you go to law school, and you you excel yeah. at all these leadership courses, and you got this great book on long range shooting. And then I see, holy cow, you've got a kids' book on gun safety. What's that all about? Well, I appreciate that, Tom. So my long-range shooting handbook first, the first person to ever publicly review it and say something about it, do you know who that was? Who's that? That was you. That was you. <laughs> the first time I oh ever my. heard my name mentioned for that book was on this show, and it just tickled me because it was the first time to hear someone mention a project you did was just so neat to hear out there, and I'll never forget that. And so now here we are, believe it or not, the first time talking about the kids' book. So I, I love your support, Tom. Uh, the kids well, book obviously, is not... you, 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 ha- you have children. How, how much did it I color do. your experience that you have <laughs> children and you have guns? Let's put those two together. What what caused you to write this book? Oh, we, we just lost him. We're going to get him back on the phone here. Let me just tell you that the title of the book, while we're getting Ryan back, is There's Only One You. If you go look on Amazon, you can find it there. Also, go look at his website, Ryan Kleckner. It's C-L-E-C-K-N-E-R. Ryan, spell that way, RyanKleckner.com. A fascinating guy. 
the idea is, uh, and we got Ryan back here. Ryan, I was asking, you've got kids and you've got guns. So put those two together. It's got to be kind of why you came up with the idea of a book titled There's Only One You. Exactly right. The idea is the kids, my daughter was learning in school fire and pool safety, but schools aren't ever going to bring up firearms or cover firearm safety. So I thought, you know, we need to do it too. And I looked out there, mm-hmm. there's some great books out there on children's gun safety. I think, I think they're wonderful. I just saw that they weren't necessarily the books for my particular kids. I wanted a book that just snuck in the firearm safety at the very end and spent most of the time being a normal kid's book on, hey, accidents can happen. I still love you. Let's clean up that mess. Let's fix that broken land. But hey, when we get to the end of the book and we introduce firearms into the mix, that's no longer just an accident. You know, we can buy new things. We can clean up messes, but there's only one you to these kids. And it's really important. Interesting. Um, so what is the takeaway? What's the message to kids as far as what to do uh, around guns? Stay away from getting adults. I, I'm, I'm big on the far, firearm safety rules. As a matter of fact, my long-range shooting handbook, Chapter 1, is dedicated only to firearm safety. But for these smaller kids, I don't think the rules, although the firearm safety rules of treat all firearms like they're loaded, only point them in a safe direction, they are gospel. I don't think a right. three-year-old's going to grasp those. So I think the message they I, need at this I, I age agree. is get away from the gun and go tell an adult. And it's and really the end. It, it's not getting the it, message to parents, really. Well, it's the Eddie Eagle message, isn't it? It is. It's a head eagle message. It sure is. It's just it, trying to sneak in a book that may be anti-gunners even. I, I don't support well, their beliefs, but if they need to educate their kids too and just sticking their head in the sand isn't going to help kids be safer on firearms. Well, I, I'm glad you mentioned that because I was going to say, and I always tell people, look, you may not have guns in your home. But not teaching your kids about gun safety, and if they're small, it's about gun avoidance. I mean, that's what it really is. That's like raising kids and not teaching them to cross the street safely. It's just irresponsible. Exactly. You may not have a pool at your home, but you're still going to teach your kids about water safety because you never know where they're going to be when they encounter one. I hear parents say things like, oh, all my guns are locked up. I say, great. What happens when they're over at their friend's house and they encounter a gun there? They need to know what to do. I will even go further, and I'll just tell you what I told my kids when they were you know, older, when they're getting to be uh, toward teenagers. I said, you're going to be at somebody's house, and some kid's going to pull out a gun to show you, dad's gun, whatever. I said, when that happens, you are in danger at that point. I need you to leave immediately. I need you to get away from that place. And and, and we, we had those talks, but I love the fact that this is a general kid's book about safety and acceptance and all and then you kind of slide the gun stuff in at the end, both for the kids and the parents. You know what it is? You're making it you're, – you're sprinkling sugar on the message is what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. I, I just I, – I know a kid's not going to want to hear, you know, Timmy the Air 15 talks about gun safety. And some parents mm-hmm. might be polarized against the NRA. And if this is a chance to help, great. I hope it helps. <laughs> It's an interesting point because even though we like to think, okay, Eddie Eagle, how can you have a problem with that? The mere fact that it comes from the NRA turns so many people off that they simply won't even listen to what is a a universal safety message. It's a gun avoidance message, really, but they don't understand that. You're right, and I even – I hate to admit it, but when I wrote the book, I made sure that the child encountered the gun and the story at Grandpa's house. Just so parents that didn't have perfect. guns in their home could relate to it and maybe still teach their kids the message. That's perfect. So what's the reaction? I mean, this is brand new. It's first out. So the people who have seen it, what are you getting? It's, it's been great. Uh, the, the feedback on Amazon has been wonderful. Uh, we haven't really started until right now. This is our first push to get it out there to the public to let people know that the book is available and that they should go check it out. I really appreciate it. It's been selling great so far. It's uh, getting, getting uh, number one. New release awards on Amazon, but we'll see how it holds up to the rest of books. Okay. All right. So, obviously, you know, uh, former sniper, two tours in Afghanistan, sniper instructor, long-range instructor, now an attorney, a dad. Are you doing any shooting these days? (laughs) So, after I left law school, I went into the firearms industry. I worked for the NSSF. 
I was an officer in Remington Outdoor Company. And you, right. you, everyone hears that and they think that you're going to be shooting all the time. And the sad part is right. the more you get into the industry, the less time you have to shoot. It's so true. And I can't tell you how many people have said that. Said, You know, I work at a gun store, but I never get to shoot. I work at Remington. I never get to shoot. I go, yeah, I know. Welcome to the party. We get to shoot at industry events and for work, but we hardly ever go out to just shoot for fun like we used to, right? <laughs> That's true. I try to take hunts now. And make hunts part of work, so at least I can show pictures like that. But they say the plumber's house always leaks because you're so busy dealing with it at work. But I, I try the best I can. And I'm, I'm loving writing books so much. i actually been distracted. Uh, we just started a school safety app or a family safety app, and I know nothing about making apps. But we started that about eight <laughs> or nine months ago, and I've had almost no time for anything else. All right, quick question for you. Uh, guys going hunting these days, should he side in three inches high at 100 and just hold on with that, or should he go ahead and side in and use the come-ups that are available with all these crazy, really good range finders and scopes we have these days? Depends on the tools that he has. If he has a scope that's not easily adjustable and he doesn't want to figure out what his holdovers are going to be, I would say only two inches high at 100 and call it a day because he's okay. most likely to miss by not knowing how to shoot from a kneeling or a standing position because he practiced too long at the range on a nice stable bench. Right. So he's not going to miss because of bad distance or bad angle or bad anything. He's going to miss because he jerked the trigger. But if he wants to learn it and he wants to get involved, I think all rifles should be zero to the hundred and make your adjustments from there. There you go. And now we have these beautiful, uh, inexpensive, accurate range finders. So you're not guessing anymore. Exactly right. Ryan Kleckner, thank you so much. The title of the book is There's Only One You. It's available on Amazon in Kindle form as well as uh, in printed form, right? It is. All right. Thank you so much. I wish you lots of luck with it. Thanks, Tom. Take care. All right. You take care. That's pretty cool. Got my question answered by a guy who teaches this stuff. Says, uh, if you don't have a scope that will do that easily, just sight in. He said two inches high. But if you do... Definitely sight in at 100 yards and then do your come-ups. You can crank your scope up. Know your range. Pretty sweet stuff. Hey, when we come back, let's continue the conversation about youngsters and shooting with a program that I think you're going to find interesting. Number here is 866-TALK-GUN. I'm Tom Gresham. Honey, does this holster make me look fat? The right answers to the tough questions on Tom Gresham's Gun Talk. All right, welcome back. 866-TALK-GUN. Always looking for your range of ports if you've been out doing a little shooting. If you've been, you know, hunting seasons are open. If you've been out hunting, love to know how it's going, what you found, what you saw. And what gun did you take? Did you take a new gun? Something you've had for a while? What caliber? Always, you know. People do want to know, what are you taking out there? If you're deer hunting or using a thirty out 6 are you using a two two three? Which, of course, are not, it's not good for anything. <laughs> right. All right, of course. Uh, we were talking a little bit uh, before the break about a, a new book about gun safety for youngsters. Well, let's continue to talk about uh, youngsters, in this case, a little bit older, uh, and shooting. We're going to bring in right now from the NRA, Jason Brown is joining us. Hey, Jason, welcome to Gun Talk. Thank you so much. Glad to be with you on a great Sunday afternoon here. Absolutely. So the NRA Youth Ambassador Program, what is this? We are super excited about this program. It's been around since about 2008, but we wanted to expand it this year. We're excited. It's the NRA National Youth Shooting Sports Ambassadors Program. And it is exactly what it sounds like. You know, when you think about NRA and what we do in Washington, D.C., and in the state houses across the country to defend Second Amendment rights, sometimes some of those hidden gems that the organization does get kind of, you know, off the radar. And this is one of those great programs. What we do is we scour the country looking for young high school age shooting sports athletes who are excellent representatives of what the shooting sports community is. They represent the ideals of the National Rifle Association. And we bring those kids on board for one year as official ambassadors of the shooting sports at the NR and the NRA. Okay, so we're talking about high school students who are involved in the shooting sports. I'm, I'm taking a competitive shooting. And you say you bring them on for a year. Is this like a job? Is this a paid gig? 
Oh, not a paid gig at all, not a job, but basically oh, okay. they serve as ambassadors. You know, they go through this rigorous application process, which is open right now. Uh, they turn in transcripts. We look at their school record. They write essays. They may be asked to record videos. We kind of get a whole side picture of who these youngsters are and, you know, how they represent and the idealize the shooting sports, what their accomplishments are. We want that whole okay. person concept well-rounded. And from there, we sure. whittle it down the finalist. We get these representatives, and they'll travel the country. They'll come out to NRA shows and events. And in their communities, they'll go out and set up NRA youth days. They'll go take NRA training courses. They're going to write articles about their experiences and about their sport to be used on social media and in the NRA magazines and websites. We really want to kind of build them into ambassadors, not only for what the NRA does for the shooting sports, but representatives of that whole lifestyle that can go out in their communities and even tell strangers, you know, this is what the shooting sports is really all about. Interesting. Uh, how much time are they going to be devoting to this, do you think, on, on average? Well, it depends. I mean, we, we have some kind of requirements that we, we want them to do. They're going to have a monthly conference call where they're going to call in and talk about some of the things they've done in their community to represent the shooting sports. We expect them to volunteer mm -hmm. at Friends of NRA banquets you know, in their community. We expect them to go out and take those NRA training courses that they haven't taken before. And obviously, we have major events across the country throughout the year to include the NRA annual meetings, the Great American Outdoor Show. We're actually going to pay for their travel to these events and have them out talking to NRA members that walk through. So, again, there are some baseline requirements, but obviously we encourage these youngsters to go out and be active in their communities and to continue to represent what it is to be a member of the shooting sports community and the National Rifle Association. You know, it sounds to me like it's a fabulous leadership program, and a young, I, would, I won't say boy or girl, but it be, these would actually be young men and women going through this program would come out of it with a year of incredible experience of working with uh, organizations, uh, speaking in front of groups, would, you know, whether you call it public relations or sales or whatever it is. They're just going to have a, a leg up on a lot of other people just from having this experience. Absolutely. And those are some of the things that we look for when we are making the selection. Again, we get, we get so many applications every year from such great candidates. And to have to whittle that down to fewer than 10, you know, it really is rigorous. And the kids that we will wind up selecting to be in this ambassador program are already fast burners. They're already kids who are way ahead of the curve, who are just outstanding in all facets, mm. you know, whether it's in the classroom, on the shooting range, out in public. They're just, again, those well-rounded, fully formed personalities and individuals that we think are going to be great representations of what this lifestyle is. And they're going to come away with a kind of a world-expanding experience from being able mm -hmm. to travel the country and go out. We're kind of take them out of their comfort zone of sorts. And we think, just like you said, that that's going to give them and take them to that next level, that experience, to continue long after They've been a part of this program to continue being great spokespersons for what it's like to be a part of the shooting lifestyle. Well, Jason, how, how do they apply for this thing? Well, the first thing we always suggest is to take a look at the website. It's youthambassadors.nra.org. There we'll get all the information they need about how to apply. They can take a look at list of the current and past ambassadors to see some of the work that they've done in their community. But really the most important thing to consider is that the deadline for applications for this program is October 1st. So we're really Ooh. hurtling toward that deadline. So right I up against anyone, it now. Absolutely. Anyone who's interested, go to youthambassadors.nra.org. Take a look at the requirements for application. There are several parts. Again, we're looking for school information and transcripts. We want lists of extracurricular and volunteer and shooting sports activities, personal statements. There's a lot to the process, but it's not too late if we get started as soon as possible. And we just want to see some great kids get applications in. And we expect it's always a hard process, whittling it down from so many applications. Oh, but sure. We know, just like every year that we're going to have a lot of enthusiastic youngsters and we're going to get the, you know, the cream of the crop to trot across the country and represent this fine organization. And what we've been doing now since 1871, 
for the shooting sports and the Second Amendment. Well, and, that, and I was going to say, and that's one of the things that I always tell people, I said, you don't really know the NRA. If all you know is what the media tells you, you have no idea of the dozens and dozens of programs like this that the NRA is involved with. Jason, thank you so much. I'm going to encourage people, go take a look at it. It's uh, youthambassadors.nra.org. Great job, Jason. Thank you so much for sharing this. Absolutely. Thank you for having me on. You bet. You take care. All right, 866-TALK-GUN. It is open lines right now. If there's a gun you want to talk about, a hunting story you'd like to share, or if you want to talk politics and guns, well, you know what? We've been known to do that around here. 866-TALK-GUN. Before computers, before engines and automobiles and roads, before all of this there was the land a great ocean of land with mountains black as night standing guard over all that is and was and forever will be this is the black hills of south dakota the place that made the people who make the best ammo on earth visit black-hills.com for more information all the refinements in Smith & Wesson's M&P M2.0 Pistol Series shrunk to a perfect carry size in the new compact version. 4-inch barrel, light crisp M2.0 trigger, aggressively textured grip for enhanced control, four interchangeable palm swell inserts, two magazines, lifetime service policy, 15-round 9mm mag, 13-round 40 mag, the M&P M2.0 Compact Pistol. More at smith-wesson.com. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, just, uh, I don't know, over listening to the Black Hills ammunition commercial, so I jumped over on their website. I was looking at new loads. And saw the 308 Winchester, and it, for some reason, just popped into my head. I was thinking about the whole thing. It's a game we play. Or we do it. If you had to pick only one cartridge for, and then you fill in the blank, or whatever it happens to be, if you had to pick one rifle cartridge cartridge for North American hunting, probably, this is how things change, probably 20 years ago, I would have said pick a 300 mag of some sort, just because it can do everything, and yeah, it's going to be a, more than you need for something, but it can do everything. And that's changed. And I would probably, for me, and I know a lot of people love the big magnums, for me, I would probably gravitate back to a 308. You could make an argument for the 6.5s, but it's really, really hard to go wrong with a 308. It's an honest 500 yard cartridge. Uh, you can shoot a variety of different bullets, it's unbelievably accurate. It's not a huge amount of recoil, but it's not light. I mean, it's essentially the same recoil as a thirty out 6 And if that bothers you, then dropping back to a 6.5, something like that, probably is not a bad idea. Remember, I am strongly a believer that with less recoil, you shoot better. It's as simple as that. And if you shoot better, you will hit things in the right place. And if you hit them in the right place, they will fall down, and you'll dress them out, and you'll take them home and put them in the freezer. So the better you shoot, uh, go up in power until the recoil starts to bother you. And then when that happens, what you aren't aware of is it started to bother you about two steps before you got there. So back off two steps, if you will. Uh, let's go to Bill on line two out of Liberty Mo. Hey, Bill, you're up. Tom Gresham here. Hey, Tom. Uh, about two months ago, you reported about the bump stock. I was in my gun dealer about two weeks ago. He had one for sale. Mm -hmm. I told him, mm -hmm. I said, I thought that was illegal. He said, you've been listening to fake news. And I said, well, I don't think so. <laughs> so I'm calling you to see who's right, you or him. He is. I'm right, and he is right. Both of them are right. Bump stocks are not illegal at all. Uh, and you can certainly own one, and you can buy one. I, I'm not sure where you heard that they were illegal. I heard it from Mr. Tom Grisham. Nope. I, I'm yep. always interested in, in people who say they think they heard something here. Well, I wouldn't have said I, it because I know it's not true. Well, Tom, I'll uh, I'll look it up on on the podcast. It was about two months Go for ago. It. I go for I it. Will. Take, take, I'll, uh, 
Take a look because uh, there's nothing illegal about owning one or buying one. Hasn't uh, that has not happened? The company itself has closed its doors, and they're not making them. Maybe that's what you heard, but that was voluntary on their part. But they're well, definitely not illegal. You, I, I heard you and, and one of your buddies on there talking, and you you said that the date had come and gone, and it was illegal to have one, and it nope. was on the ATF site. Nope. i tell you what you do. You go back and listen to the podcast and let me know, because this, this would not be the first time that I've been told that I said something that I never said. I appreciate it, but yeah, go take a look at it and uh, send me the file name and the time, you know, when it is, and I'll look it up and see who, look, if I said it, I was wrong. Okay. Now, it also wouldn't be the first time I've said something that I screwed up on and I was wrong on it. Now, so there's always that option out there as well. But I don't think I did because I know it's not true. And just so we can be sure, we can be clear about it. There's nothing illegal about owning a bump stock. There's nothing illegal about buying a bump stock. All right? You can have them. All right? So, yeah. They've been working on it. Okay? We understand that. Uh, but, no. It is, it, now, it depends on – there are. oh, you know what could have happened? There are some states that are passing laws about those. And I wonder if it was talking about a state. I don't know. I'm not sure what the conversation was, uh, but you'd have to you know, take a look. But there are a number of states. In fact, I think every single state there has been a measure introduced into the legislature that would do that. And, and it's interesting. It's the same law. It's the same bill, that is, introduced in every state because it comes from the same people, the Bloomberg funded people, the Moms Demand or every town, you know, all that bunch of stuff. AstroTurf groups that are funded by the billionaire Bloomberg. And so, and the tricky part about it is, they come in, they, they will tell you it's a bump stock bill. But when you actually read it in typical fashion, there's so much more in there. It's basically what it would do is it would outlaw aftermarket triggers. If any aftermarket thing you do, any modification you do to the gun, makes it possible for you to fire the gun more quickly then that would be illegal. Well, you could argue that a better aftermarket trigger could do that. It's one of, the, one of the many reasons we oppose those. Line three, Luke is with us out of Syracuse, New York. Hello, Luke. You're on Gun Talk. Hey, Luke, uh, you there? Just, yep, I'm here. Can you hear me okay? Yep, I can. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I had a range report um, at the I call a Romeo 5 red dot. And I mounted it to my Mossberg 500, and it's awesome. Now, that's interesting. You put the red dot on your shotgun. So what was the point of that? What, what are you doing with that shotgun? Um, I'm going to be taking a uh, tactical shotgun course. Mm-hmm. And it was the only option that I currently have to mount it to. So I figured, why not? Well, I mean, I think it's a great combo. I mean, I love the the pump shotguns, and I think a red dot sight is one of the best things you can put on. In fact, you could actually say on most guns, particularly if it's a self-defense tactical, something you want to be fast, and it's going to be shooting up fairly close range. Yeah. Uh, I love it. So have you shot it? I have. I, I took it to the range, and I sighted it in, and it was easy, quick, and uh, I was sending lead down range, so it was fun. Let me ask you a question. With the Romeo 5, when you cheek that gun, put it up to your shoulder and cheek it, uh, if you cheek the gun hard, are you looking down below the sight? Do you have to kind of pick your head up off the uh, cheek piece to, uh, to see through it? No. See, it comes with two platforms. So it, you, can, you can mount it to like a spacer and then mount it mm-hmm. to your rail. And I opted to uh, not have it on the spacer because yes, I found that I had to pick my cheek up off the stock in order to see through it. But once I took you were, the riser you were so out, far, you, you were way ahead of me, partner. Cause that's what I was going to say is make sure that you can just cheek that gun hard and see right through it. But you, you're already there. Congratulations. Well done. Great range report. Red dot sights. I'm a huge fan. Just put one on a uh, Ruger 1022. Oh my gosh. I'm having so much fun with that thing. It's just a hoot. Uh, it makes, it makes life easy. 
and you can teach anybody to shoot with a red dot sight. Put red dot on target, pull trigger, pull it goes there. Simple as that. What's your range report? 866-TALK-GUN. Hey, Stuart's called in from Houston, Texas on line four. Hey, Stuart, you're on Gun Talk. Uh, Hello, morning. Stuart. Hello, I'm here. Can you hear me now? I got you. Go ahead. Hey, I got a different point of view on uh, some statistics you shared. Uh, you remember okay. the uh, FBI report on uh, mm-hmm. mass shootings where they had 50 mm-hmm. of them in 2016 and 17? And mm-hmm. you said 16% of the time because eight times civilians stopped the mass shooting. I got a different point of view. Civilians okay. only got involved in 10 of them. So out of the 10 times they did get involved, 80% of the time they were successful. <laughs> yeah, you know what? That's just that's a different way of looking at it, and I think you're right. I probably just completely missed that one. Uh, but you're right. If Every time the civilians got involved of the t- times they did, they were successful 80% of the time. That's fascinating. What made you come up with that? Um, I've been looking at statistics for a while, like um, the FBI crime report. If in mm-hmm. 2016, if you take all of their violent crimes and their robberies and burglaries, it comes out to about 1% resulted in death of any kind, whether it was a firearm, drowning, whatever. Mm-hmm. But if you take the CDC's 2.4 million and apply that same 1%, that means mm-hmm. 24,000 lives were saved by firearms. Well, there you go again. You're trying to show people that good people use guns to save lives. And you know that can't possibly be true because we're told all the time that that never happens. Yeah, by the <laughs> MSM, that's for sure. <laughs> I know. Hey, Tom, you keep I, up the I, good work. I just wanted to share those numbers with you, that perspective. Great, Stuart. Appreciate that. Good numbers. Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. Yeah, Stuart was mentioned the Centers for Disease Control came up with a number of about 2.4 million times a year people use guns in self-defense. Most of the time, they don't have to pull the trigger, obviously. Generally, when you – sometimes it's just saying, hey, I've got a gun. You need to leave. And they do. Okay. That counts because the implication that you have a gun was what caused the crime to not happen. Or sometimes they just simply pull a gun out. In one case, a friend of mine – was at an ATM, and he had two guys starting to move in on him on a 45-degree angle, a pincer move. And, I mean, they were coming fast. And my buddy just turned around and basically pulled his coat back and put his hand on his 1911, never took it out. And these guys, it was, he said it was like a cartoon. It's like they stopped on their heels, going, stopped, turned around, and took off. He never pulled it out. And it, now, for me, that is a defensive gun use. That is stopping a crime with a gun. Nobody got shot. Didn't even pull it out. But they understood what was going on. And so that's, that's how that happened. 2.4 million times a year. And if you use that 1% number that uh, Stuart was talking about, that's 24,000 lives saved a year. And the number of people k- murdered with firearms is about, depends on the year, but you call it between nine and 11,000 a year. That's a whole lot more people saved with guns than are murdered with guns. And, you know, it is dishonest to talk about the role of firearms in crime without talking about the role of firearms in saving lives and stopping crime. It'd be as though you're talking about all the mistakes that doctors make and result in the loss of life without talking about, yes, but doctors save far more lives than their mistakes cost. That would be dishonest as well. Well, I don't know, maybe expecting honesty from the gun ban lobby is not what we do. Hey, what happens if you get into a self-defense shooting? What should you do next? That's what we'll talk about when we come back. Also taking your calls, your comments, questions. And if you just flat out disagree with something I've said here, well, I want to know, call me, 866-TALK-GUN. I'm Tom Gresham. This is Gun Talk.